Hey, good morning. We'll wait another minute or so. We've got eight students here. Okay, um, today we are going to continue talking about lines. Um, we are going to um, talk about the slope intercept method and then parallel perpendicular lines. And then we're gonna get into functions and functional notation. And that'll be it for today. So we actually may end early depending on if we can get through this in time. So we'll see. Uh, any questions over homework? I was anticipating that perhaps people would have some questions. Oh, no questions. Oh, I think I had a question on, gosh, I'm trying to read my hand. Number nine, like I think I did it, but I was confused on how I did it. <laughs> okay, is it is it nine from page 67 or from the other section? Uh, from, it's from page 53. Number nine, this one right here? Yes. Okay, yeah, this is a good one. Uh, where's my program? Hold on. Hmm. Okay, give me a second, my program's not working. Try it again. There we go. Okay, so um, you're asked to sketch this using, um, well, hold on, what were the instructions, sorry. Solving the equation, and we're filling, oh no. Solve the equations. Yeah, this is a solving equation. So this is from, let's see, from, Hmm. Was that page not a part of the homework? Like, did I do the wrong homework? No, no, no. That's not it. I'm just, this is a solving equations. This is not a graph. Let me see something, hold on. I started here. So you were doing this Right here, one through 15, all page 53, right? That's what yes. you're doing? Okay, let me go back to that. Because hmm. this is what we did, right? We did. Something looks wrong with the assignment. Hold on. This, this is the homework for this should have been. Right here. These. Why did it say that it says the wrong page here, doesn't it? You see that? Yeah. Linear graphs intercept intercept method, right? That's what we're doing. Shoot. Okay. Well, that's an issue because this is we covered we covered um, 
this last time, right? The intercept method, which starts right here on page 61. And then we finish it and then we should be doing the homework for this right here, the intercept method, which starts on 65. That's a problem. So this is a typo in the, um, remember I told you they make a, someone else made up this packet and then they, they create the, all the homework sets and they should match up. This is, this was wrong. Let me see, let me see if this one is right, page 75. See, this one's right. This is the homework for the slope intercept method. That's the correct page number. So I, you did the right thing off the calendar, but it's a mistake on the calendar, which I didn't notice and I apologize for that. No, it's okay. I was like doing them and I was like, I feel like we did these another yeah. time. It says to do that, so I'll just do them. Yeah, okay. So look, everyone, this, this kind of sucks, but you're going to have to go and do the homework. Make sure you do the homework that starts, let's just say, starts on page 65, okay? And just do problems three through, do three through 10. So, page 65, three through 10. And this covers um, the intercept method. Sorry. So do you want me to still work that problem? Uh, no, it's okay, because that's sure. kind of, yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right, so that covers this right here is covers last class. So for today, what we're doing is we're doing, we kind of started talking about it um, last time. And that is when it comes to um, linear equations with two variables, usually X and Y, that when you look at these, these are lines. When we draw them, we get lines. And there are two ways to draw these. We have the intercept method, which is what we did last time, intercept method. And the other way of doing it is to do what's called the slope intercept method. And that's what today is about. Okay, so today we make sure we understand the slope intercept method. Now for the intercept method, what you did was you found the X and Y intercepts, found two points and drew a line. Do I, maybe I'll just put it up here just as a reminder. Last class. Okay, the intercept method was this. Okay, to, to sketch the solutions, basically to sketch the line, we only need two points. So what we do is we find the X and the Y intercept to find the x-intercept, we set y to equal to zero, we solve for x. To find the y-intercept, we set x equal to zero and solve for y. Once we have those two points, we plot them, draw a line, we're done. Okay, so that was the intercept method. The slope-intercept method is completely different, okay? The way we do the slope-intercept method is we start with the equation, okay? Whatever the equation looks like and we solve it for y. Okay, so we're not plugging in zero for anything. We're just gonna move things around algebraically to where we get y by itself. When we do that, we should always wind up with something that looks like this. It'll be y is equal to some number here. Okay, this is a number. And then plus some number here. 
this number is always your slope of your line, and this is always your y-intercept, always. And if you know the y-intercept and you know the slope, you can always draw the line, okay? So the best way to see this slope-intercept method is, is to do examples. So I'm just gonna do another one. I know we've already done some from last class, but just as a reminder, let's do one. So let's sketch a negative 2x plus 5y equals 20. So when we look at this, the first thing that we notice is that it is a linear equation in two variables because we have an equals, right? So it's an equation. We have two variables. Both of those variables are raised to the first power, which makes it linear. So we know that we have a line. Now, um, hang tight real quick. Sorry about that, sorry about that. Okay, so we have a linear equation with two variables in it. And so we're, we could use the intercept method, but right now let's use the slope intercept method. So I'm gonna try and get y by itself on one side of the equation. So let's see here. How about, is Elisa here? Elisa? Yes, I'm here. I might cut out a bit though because my internet's really, really bad today. Okay. Well, Elisa, let me ask you, if you if I were asking you to get this Y by itself, what could you do to start to start that process? How could you start getting this by itself? What could you do? I would start by adding two X to the other side. Good, okay, so everyone, this is kind of gonna be the standard process. We first try and get the X term out of here. So we'll add two X to both sides. Very good. When we do that, we will do, we will have five Y equals, uh, let's put the two X in front of the 20. And Elisa, we cannot combine these together, right? Two X and uh, 20 cannot be put together because they're, they're not like terms, right? Yes. Okay. So we'll stick with you, Lisa, because you did fine on that. How would you now get just Y and not 5Y? So how would you get rid of the 5 here? You would, I want to say you would just divide the 5 on the other side. Exactly. So because the 5 is being multiplied times Y, we will divide both sides by 5. And when we say divide, that means we divide everything by 5 on both sides. So the five goes away, we're left with y. Here, this two x time, uh, over five, we're gonna write it this way, two over five times x, and then plus 20 divided by five, which is four. And now we have it. This is what we were looking for. This looks like, Elisa, you're off the hook, thank you. This looks like y equals mx plus b. Katrina, are you here? Yes, I'm here. Okay, so any questions on that? Um, I don't think so. Okay, so if this now looks like y equals mx plus b, then Katrina, can you tell me what m is? What's m for us here? Um, is it the two over five? Two over five, okay, and then what's the b? Four. Four, okay. So what that tells us is that when we go to graph this, four is our y-intercept and the two-fifths is our slope. Let me move this down a little bit. This is our slope, which is always referred to as the rise over the run, which for us would be the two over five. 
Having a two on top means we rise by five, means we go up by two. Having a five on the bottom, the run is left and right. Because it's positive, we go to the right five. So, Katrina, let's graph this, okay? Katrina, we always start when we do these lines using this method. Katrina, we always start at the y-intercept, okay? And you said the y-intercept was what? Four. Four, okay, so on the y-axis, I'm gonna move up four. One, two, three, four, that's about right here. One, two, three, there's four. Okay, so I put a dot here. And then, Katrina, um, from that point, I need to slope to the next point. So, Katrina, I'm gonna go where from here? Um, is it two up? Two up, okay, so that's one, two up, and then? Five across. Five to the left or right? Uh, to the right. To the right, one, two, three, four, five, and then right there I put a dot, right? Once we have that, two points on a line, we draw a straight line and we're done. And that's it. Is that good, everyone? Any questions? We'll do another one. What question? Yes. If it was negative two over five, would it be two down and five left? Let's do one like that. Okay. I, that was exactly what I wanted to do next is what would happen if we had a negative here. So let's do one like that. Okay. So as a new example, let us sketch. Uh, let's go with four X plus three Y plus 18 equals zero. Okay, so I'm giving you this, this is the first time I've given you one that looks kind of like this. Um, is Piero here? I don't think Piero's here. Uh, Sergio? No. Let's see, Juliet, are you here? Yeah. Okay, Juliet. So are you following everything up to this point, Juliet? Yeah. Okay. So do you see that we have a linear equation with two variables? I mean, that's always the most important thing is that you understand what you're looking at. So do you see that's an equation? We have two variables. Yes. So yes. let's get Y by itself. How are you going to get the Y by itself? What do you want to do first? Um, minus 4X okay. on each side. So you can subtract 4x here, subtract 4x here. Let's just go ahead and do that. So Juliet, what would be left on the left-hand side? What do we still have? Um, 18. And so you uh, subtract 18. Yep. Yeah, and the 3y. So we still have the 18 over there. So we need to now take care of the 18. I think I heard you say subtract it, right? Yeah. Okay, so we'll subtract the 18 on both sides. Now we have... 3y equals, we had the negative 4x on the right, and now we've introduced a negative 18 also, right? Minus 18. Cannot combine these together. Okay, Juliet, last step is to do what to get y by itself? Um, divide them all by three. Divide by three. Three here, three here, three here, right? So we will have at the end of this y equals. Now this part here, put the numbers out in front, negative four over three x, and then minus 18 divided by three, that's just six. That looks like y equals mx plus b. All right, Evelyn, are you here? Let's see, Evelyn. Lily? Yes, sorry. I didn't know if you said my name or not. Not yet. I just did, though. How are you doing, Lily? Good, thanks. Good. You, you okay with all this? I think so, yeah. Okay. I know a lot of you have seen this before, like 
back in high school or something, but it, maybe it's been a while. So we just got to make sure we know how to do this. Um, the slope here for us, Lily, is what? Negative four thirds. Negative four thirds. And then the y-intercept, be careful here. What's our y-intercept? Negative six. Negative six. Good. It's, you have to include the net number. So if it's, I mean, the sign. So if it's negative, we're going to be, we're going to say our y-intercept is negative six. This is our y-intercept. And then really our slope here, right? Our slope, our rise over run is equal to negative four over three. So what does the negative four tell us, Lily? That we're gonna rise by negative four really means what? That what, sorry, what did you ask? I asked if I tell you to rise by negative four, what does that really mean? What direction do you really go? The left. So rise, rise is up and down, right? Yes. So, so oh, so you go, you go down. Sorry. Down four. So the top here says that we're going to go down four, and then the run is on the bottom. That's your left and right. And because mm -hmm. the run is positive, we're going to go to the right three. Mm -hmm. Is everyone clear with that? Now, Dina asked about the negative here. Okay, I want to point something out. I told y'all like earlier this semester that if you have a negative on a fraction, like negative four over three, you can write that as four over negative three. And you can also write it with the negative in front and the four thirds like that. These are all the same. So I just wanna show you that if I were to change this and move the negative to the bottom, right? Like this, I could do that. That would be legal to move the negative to the bottom. Now what this would tell me is I go up four into the left three. See, it's opposite. Instead of down four, it's up four. Instead of right three, it's left three. And you could use either one of these. It's up to you. And I'm gonna show you right now that you'll get the same answer, okay? So let's, let's prove to ourselves that it doesn't matter which one we use. So I'm gonna to go to my graph. And Lily, where are we starting? What's the first thing I put on this graph? We start at the origin. Okay. And then are you going, are you going to do the top one or the negative four thirds or four over negative three? Well, we'll do, we'll do the, um, we'll do the negative four over three. Okay. That's your mm -hmm. slope. But you said start at the origin. Mm -hmm. Okay. Be careful. In this form, you want to always. Oh, no. Sorry. You start at the intercept. Okay, good. So you start at the intercept, which is negative, negative six, right? So that means we're going to have to move down six first. One, two, three, four, five, six. There's negative six, and there's where we start. Now, Lily, go ahead. Let's do the red one. So from that point, which way do we go? Uh, you can go down four. Down four. So I'm going to go down four. One, two, three, four, and then. And then up to the right three. Right three. So one, two, three. I drop another dot here and then I'll draw a straight line, right? Mm -hmm. That would be it. Now, Lily, I'll stick with you on this. What if what if you were like a rebel, right? Lily's a rebel here. And Lily wants to do this one instead. We still start at negative six, right? That you always start with. But now, Lily, go and do this. So from here, you'll go where? Up four. Four, and one, two, three, four, and then left, left three. three, and put a dot here instead. You see the difference? Mm -hmm. Do you see that even though you do the black one and as opposed to the red one, do you see that they all lie on the same line? Mm -hmm. So it doesn't matter which way you do it. You get the same result. Okay. Dina, does that kind of clarify a little bit maybe what your question was addressing? Yeah. Okay. So the important things to take away, you solve for Y, identify your Y intercept, identify your slope, figure out your up, down, left, right, figure that out. And then always start at your Y intercept. And then from that, you use your slope to move around and just find one more point and you're done. So what makes this, this um, I guess, nice is that 
a lot of times in the real world, when we look at problems that involve linear equations, a lot of times they look like this. Like they're already, they're already given to us in this form. Like that's the way the problem appears. So if you're asked to graph it, it's very simple if it's in this form. Do you all see this is already y equals mx plus b? Like this. And so if I wanted to graph this, I would just go, okay, my y-intercept is three. So up three, one, two, three, boom, put a point. Here's my rise over run. So I go up one to the right two, up one, right two, draw a point, draw a line, and I'm done. So if you, once you get used to it, it becomes very quick. It's a very fast process if it's already given to you that way. Any questions? Okay, let's do one more, and then I'm going to give you a few to, to look at yourselves. Okay, so what about this one? Let's go negative 7x um, minus 4y equals 11. All right, so I'm going to move through this one myself a little fast. First thing I'm going to do, I'm trying to get the y by itself. So I'm going to get rid of the 7x. So I add 7x to both sides. Goes away. I have negative 4y equals 7x plus 11. Almost there. I need to get the negative 4 out of here. So I divide by negative 4, divide by negative 4, divide by negative 4. The y's cancel, I mean, sorry, the negative four's cancel. I get y here. Here I get seven over negative four x. And now this one's the part that's a little tricky here. You have 11 divided by negative four. So I'm gonna write that as negative 11 over four. And at this point, I have my y-intercept and I have my slope. Any questions up to that point? Yes, I get confused when we have to do that last number, when it's like, like how you just got 11 over four instead of 11 minus four. I'm dividing, right? I'm dividing each thing by four, negative four, not subtracting. Oh, okay, okay. Right, because this, this when we have negative, negative four y, on the left hand side and we want to get rid of the negative four we have to we have to understand that that's multiplication it's negative four times y and so to undo multiplication we use division to undo it and whatever you do to the left side you have to do to the right side the seven x on the other hand this is not this is being subtracted not multiplied so that's why we add it on both sides that makes sense yes sir I do. Okay. Okay, so now what I'm going to do, this is, this is going to be a little tricky because we have fractions now. I need to figure out where my y-intercept is. So where is 11 over 4, right? Where is it? And it's negative, so I need to go down. So this is where you just get your calculator out and you convert 11, you just do 11 divided by 4 on your calculator, and that'll give you, this is really 2.75. So that means I need to move down 2.75. I'm going to exaggerate here. If this is one, sorry, negative one. If that's negative one, negative two, say ne this is negative three. I'm going to move down negative 2.75, which is about here. We're just going to kind of eyeball this. It doesn't have to be perfect. And now from here, where do I go from this point? Use the slope. So let me ask someone, how about Bela? Bela? Are you there? I thought I saw Bela. Tiffany? Tiffany, Tiffany, no. Cheyenne? Oh, I'm sorry, I was in the restroom. Oh, no, it's okay, Tiffany. All right, so Tiffany's here. Yes, hi. All right, did you, do I need to give you a little more time? Um, I think so. I'm sorry. Okay. All right. I'll come back to you. Thank you. All right. 
So how about Cheyenne? Diane? Yes. Hey, Diane, I just want to know where to go like from here. I've got my y intercept negative 2.75. How do I get to another point? Where do I go? Um, I guess it's you can go up and left. Okay, up how much? Uh, left. Wait. You're right. Okay. Seven. So we're going to go up seven. And left four. Four, right? Good. Mm -hmm. So from here, now see, this is where things get a little weird because we're not, we're not exactly on a number. So we have to be careful as we move up. Um, up seven, should, I think I'm going to go off my graph. I don't think I'm going to have enough room. So I'm going to cheat. I'm going to move this whole thing down. Okay, so if I need to go up seven, here's one, here's two, here's three, there's four, there's five. Let me go up to six here. Now, remember, we're starting from this red dot and we're moving up seven. So watch me do this. I'm going to jump. Let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, that's jump up seven and then to the left, four. See, I'm counting by, let's see, negative one, negative two, negative three, negative four. So I'm going to jump over from there. Let's see, that's one, two, three, four. I should be right around here. And then we just draw a straight line. So that was four, one, two, three, jumped over four. That makes sense, everyone? It's a little weird when you get decimals because you can't be real precise, but we try and get as, as close as we can. Okay, I said I was gonna give you a few, but let me, let me cover a couple more things before we do that. Slopes, let's just talk about slopes for a second. Okay, let me give you four different scenarios that you could have when you draw a line. One, two, three, four. If you draw a line, you could have something like this, or you could have something like this, or you could have a horizontal line, or you could have a vertical line. Those are like the only four possibilities when you draw a line. If, if you look at this first one, think about it like reading a book from, from left to right. You know, when we read books, we read from left to right. If you look at this line, if you move from left to right, it's like, like a roller coaster. It's rising, right? It's like you'd be going up as you go from left to right. So it rises. Rising. Right? But this one, you would actually be going down, so you'd be like falling. This one would be not rising or falling, right? It would just be flat. And this one would be straight up and down, right? This would be completely vertical. So the slope, actually, you can tell by just looking at the slope which of these four cases it's going to be. In this case here, I can tell you that guaranteed the slope, M, whatever that rise over run is, has to be a positive number. Greater than zero has to be positive. So slope positive. Here, I can tell you guaranteed that your slope would have to be less than zero. In other words, your slope is negative. This one, I guarantee you, if it's a flat line, your slope has to be zero. And this last one, Vertical lines, the slope is what we set, what we call undefined. So if we go back and look at the, the problems we've done today, this, this right here, the slope we had for this line, do you all see our slope was 
seven over negative four, that would be a negative number, right? Set a positive number divided by a negative number, that's a negative value. So do y'all see our line falls as we move from left to right? That's not a coincidence. That's because the slope is negative. If we look at the problem we did before that, here, the slope here is positive, right? One divided by two is a positive number. So you can see it rises. This one, the slope was negative four over three. That's a negative number. And you can see by the picture it falls. Okay, so the slope, here's another one, positive, and you can see it rises. So the slope tells us a, a lot about a line, whether or not it's rising or falling, flat or vertical. Make sense? That makes sense to everyone? Any questions? Okay, um, so the next concept before I give you some examples to work um, is parallel versus perpendicular lines. Now, I'm pretty sure that everyone here has heard these terms before, parallel and perpendicular. But let's just talk about this. <clears throat> I'm going to ask somebody, <clears throat> let's see, how about Caitlin? Let's go with Caitlin. Caitlin, if you were going to tr try and describe to somebody, explain to a, to a young child what parallel lines are, what would you, how would you describe parallel lines to them? Um, I would just say that they go straight up and down, like right next to each other, kind of like, well, how I was taught is like how to remember it, it would be like parallel because there's like two L's like right next to each other. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like up and down. So <laughs> you, when you're thinking parallel, you're thinking like two lines that you said are like right next to one another like this? Wouldn't they be like, am I wrong? Wouldn't they just be like directly like top to bottom, not like at a diagonal or is okay, that? So just straight up and down like this. Yeah. Okay, I agree that those would be parallel. These would also be parallel. They don't have to be straight up and down. They they just have to be kind yeah, of- Yeah, yeah, side by side. Oh, side by okay. Side. Yeah, and so then so. wouldn't perpendicular be uh, like cross? Okay. Yeah, like, like a cross, like, yeah. yes, exactly. Okay, so let's let's keep going with this idea of parallel. I'm going to draw you two lines, and you tell me whether or not they're parallel. I'm going to be ready. Here it goes. Here's one line. Here's another line. Are those parallel? Do those look parallel to you? Yes, somewhat. No. Somewhat. Let me exaggerate this a little bit. Okay. Do those look parallel to you? No. Well, why not? What's wrong? Because they're not like perfectly in line with each other. Like one's at an angle. What's going to happen eventually to the, these two lines? They're going to get further and further apart. If we, in one direction, they're going to get further apart, but in the other direction, what are they going to do? Intersect. They're going to intersect at some point, right? So maybe a way that we could say, describe parallel lines is that they're two lines that never intersect, right? If you give yeah. me two lines and draw them and they never intersect one another, then they would be parallel. You all agree with that? Yeah. yeah. That sounds like a pretty good definition, right? Two parallel lines are, two lines are parallel if they never intersect. What's another way we could say that in terms of slopes? What do all parallel oh. lines have to have in common? They would have to have the same slope. Same slope, right? In order for them to be parallel, they have to have the exact same slope. So whatever the whatever the slope is, like if, if, if I call this L1 for line one and I call this L2, then do you agree that whatever the slope is of this line, like this line has a slope, right? A rise over run. This one here has its own slope. M1 and M2, do you all agree that to be parallel, they have to be the same? Because if one of them has a slightly different pitch, 
then they're eventually going to hit each other somewhere, right? So that is the definition of two parallel lines. Let me get rid of this. Two lines are parallel if they have equal slopes. Oops, slopes equal slopes. And that's it. That's what it takes for two lines to be parallel. They have to have the same slope. So let me give you an example. What if I tell you the line L1 is this line? And then I tell you that L2 is this line. Do you all see that both of these lines are written in slope intercept form already? They both look like y equals mx plus b. Do you all see that? So they're both solved for y. So what is the slope of the first line? What is the slope of, of this first line? Anybody? 2x. 2, just the 2, just the number in front of the x, just 2, right? That's the slope of the first line. What's the slope of the second line? Yeah, the same thing too. They're the same, right? So that means if I graph these, they have the same pitch, which means they're going to be parallel. So do you all see how if you have the equation in, in slope intercept form, it's very easy to compare them? What about what about L3? I'm going to give you a third line. Y equals negative 2x plus 1. Would L3 be parallel to these? No. No, because it's negative two, right? So these two would be parallel. Because they have the same slope. This one would not be parallel to either one of those. Are you all with me? Any questions on that? Okay. Now, what about perpendicular? What is the relationship between the slopes? I mean, we know that perpendicular means they, they, they intersect at this perfect cross, right? Like, like that's not parallel. Like, let me get to another page here. I'm sorry, perpendicular. If I give you two lines that look like this, they're definitely not parallel because they hit each other, but they're not perpendicular either. For perpendicular, we, don't we need this to be like a perfect cross? Like it has to be like perfect. We could draw it sideways. All we need is that this is a perfect corner. Okay, that has to be a perfect, what we say, 90 degree corner. Those are perpendicular. Perpendicular. This is not parallel and it's not perpendicular. We actually call this skew. That's the name for it. You probably have not heard that before, but. Two lines that are not parallel and not perpendicular are called skew to one another, they're skew lines. But what do you think the relationship is between the slopes? If we, we focus our attention on perpendicular only, we said for parallel, the slopes had to be the same, but what do you think the relationship is for perpendicular? Sir, I don't know the way to word it, but I would say that like you need a 90 degree angle, like they have to intersect a certain way. Uh-huh. That's right. Yeah. They do. I'm saying, though, I'm asking you, like, with parallel, all we needed, it was very easy to describe it because all we said was, oh, well, if they have the same slopes, right, if the slopes are equal, then they're parallel. Can we say something that's simple for perpendicular? What do you, what well, do you think the relationship between the slopes is? For perpendicular, wouldn't it have to be like the reciprocal of it, if I'm not wrong? Okay, so reciprocal is, so look at, look at this example here. These two lines were not parallel, right? Because this one has a slope of two. The other one is negative two. So they're not parallel. But maybe that's what it takes to be perpendicular. Maybe they just have to be opposites. Like the slope of this is two. The slope of this is negative two. Maybe that's what it is. And, and maybe I can convince you. Let's look at it. I'm going to, I'm going to graph this, okay? 
So what were they? 2x minus 9 and negative 2x plus 1. y equals 2x minus 9. Okay, that's 1. Here's y equals negative 2x plus 1. Okay, there are the two lines. Do those look perpendicular to you? Do they look like they hit at a perfect no. degree? No, right? They don't? You all agree? Everyone agree? Those don't look like they are perpendicular. So it doesn't look like having a negative two, like taking the opposite is, is what does it. Now, I think Bonnie said reciprocal, right? So if the slope of this line, Bonnie knows that the slope of that line is two, what if we make the slope of this line the reciprocal of it? What's the reciprocal of two? So since I think Bonnie um, said it, what is the reciprocal? One over two or one half. One half. Okay, so what Bonnie's doing here is rewriting two as two over one and then flipping the fraction over. That's called the reciprocal. Okay, so Bonnie thinks maybe it's the reciprocal. We know it's not the opposite, right? If we start with two, we take negative two, it doesn't work. So Bonnie said, let's try the reciprocal. Let's do it here. Let's, let's do the reciprocal one half here. What do y'all think? Is it gonna work? Let's see, I'm gonna put it here. One half in front of the X. One half up, there it is. Oops, yeah. So what do y'all think? Did that work? Do those look parallel? I mean, sorry, perpendicular? No, right? So then you sit there and you're like, crap, well, what is it then? Well, check this out. Bonnie was almost right. It's the reciprocal, but you also have to change the sign. So since we started with positive two, we're not gonna use one half, we're gonna use negative one half. So watch, if I put a negative in front, there it is. That's what it takes. Now they are perpendicular. See, they hit it a perfect 90. It kind of doesn't look like it. Well, that's weird. It's, but, but this is truly a 90 degree angle right there, all right? So let me summarize that. Let me summarize that um, back on our notes page. So two lines are perpendicular if the slopes are not equal, but are what we call opposite reciprocals. Opposite reciprocals. So I'm gonna give you a couple of examples so you can see this. For example, if we had a line L1 and it was Y equals two X minus nine, then line two, if it had a slope of negative one half X, though these two lines would be perpendicular because these two numbers, the yellow and the blue are opposite reciprocals. You take one of them, you flip it, you change the sign, and you get um, a perpendicular line. Let me ask someone now. I'm going to give somebody a line. Let's go back to Tiffany. Tiffany, are you back? You here? Yes, hi. Okay, so Tiffany, if I if I gave you that line. Tiffany, what's the slope of that line right now that I just gave you? Uh, the slope is negative uh, four. Negative four. Okay. So you give me the slope of a different line that would be perpendicular to that. So tell me what you're going to do in order to figure that out. Um, so you would do the opposite reciprocal. So would it be the one over four? Exactly. So you're taking negative four, you're writing it as a fraction you're flipping it over and changing the sign. And you said that that would be one over four. X, right? Mm -hmm. Good. And then this right here, you can put any number you want here. So go ahead, um, Tiffany, give me anything you want over here. You can say plus something or minus something, doesn't matter. Plus nine. Plus nine. There we go. 
these would be perpendicular. So do you see that um, Tiffany, all she did was created the slope from the opposite reciprocal? Let me graph these just to confirm that it's actually doing what it's supposed to. Negative four X plus three was the first line. And then Tiffany came up with um, one fourth X plus nine. There's the other one. And I hope that you can convince yourself that those two lines are perpendicular to one another. Questions? So at the end of the day, to, to determine if two lines are parallel or perpendicular, what you have to do is compare their slopes. If the slopes are the same, you're parallel. If they're opposite reciprocals, they are perpendicular. What if they're neither? What if they're not equal or opposite reciprocals? Then what? Are they skew? They'd be skew. Okay. So now I'm going to give you a chance to work on some problems, all right? And I'm going to put you all in breakout rooms so that you can work together on these. So I'm going to give you um, I'm going to give you two sets of problems, all right? So the first problem is this. L1 is this line, 3x minus, uh, let's go plus 7y equals 28. L2 is, let's go with 7x plus 3y equals 12. And here's what I want you to do. Sketch L1 and L2 using slope intercept. That's what we learned today. And um, determine if L1 and L2 are parallel, perpendicular, or skew. That's the first problem. The second problem is basically the exact same directions, but I'm gonna change some things here. Let's go with 2x minus y is four. And then let's go with um, negative 6x plus 3y equals 15. All right, everyone take a moment to copy these down. And then I'm going to assign you to breakout rooms. And then I want each, you know, y'all try to talk to each other. I know it's hard on Zoom to like show each other your work and stuff, but at least you can talk to each other like, hey, what are you going to do to do start this? Okay, here's what I'm getting. What are you getting? I, I'm encouraging that. Hopefully you will. If not, you know, I can't force you to do it. But uh, anybody have a question about the instructions? Okay, I'm going to assign the breakout rooms. And these will be created automatically. There's going to be three to four people in each room. So as soon as you copy these down, down, go ahead and join the room. We'll probably take, I don't know, 10 to 15 minutes to, to go through this, all right? And then I'll call on people for answers.
Jamal, if you're not there responding, I'm going to remove you from the room for not participating.
We'll wait for everyone to get back in here and we'll talk about these problems. Okay, I think everybody's back. So is there a group that wants to volunteer what they determined for the first problem? Uh, for the first problem, we had got skew because when you graphed it, it was more at a less than a 90 degree angle. Okay. And for, and okay. then so on that one did y'all solve each of these for why uh, for yes, me that it was perpendicular you guys perpendicular okay so did y'all did y'all solve for why on these yes okay. so on on the first one let's go we'll do <clears throat> dina and then we'll do bonnie dina on line one when y'all solve for why what did you get y equals what Y equal negative three over seven X plus four. Okay, I think I agree with that. Uh, Bonnie, what did y'all get on yours for the second one? Uh, we got Y equals negative seven over three X plus four. Plus four again, yes. Okay, so by just looking at these, all right, everyone, by just looking at these, we can compare the two slopes. Right? And the question is first, are they parallel? Well, th that would mean these have to be exactly the same, which they're not, right? So we can automatically say they're not parallel. Now to be perpendicular, these two have to be opposite reciprocals. So if I take this and I flip it over, it becomes seven over negative three, but then I need, to, so this is the reciprocal, But then I need to take the opposite of it. And the opposite of it changes the sign. So this is actually a negative number so that the opposite would be positive seven over three. And that is not equal to that, okay? It's not, it's, it's just not quite there. If this were a positive seven over three, then they would be perpendicular. But because it's the same sign, they're both negative, right? To start with, can't be perpendicular. So let's take a look at this. This is the actual, this is me solving for y on the first one and second one. And then this is me graphing both of the lines. So when I graphed this one, I went to the y-intercept of four. And from that point, I went down three to the right seven. So down one, two, three, and then to the right seven, and I drew a line. And then on this one, my y-intercept is also four. This time I went down seven to the right three. So I went down seven into the right three and I have this line. And you can kind of see from this picture that they don't quite, they're not, they're, they're definitely not parallel, but they're not quite perpendicular either because this is, this is not a square, right? So you gotta be careful a little bit on these slopes to make sure that opposite reciprocal, the, the sign has to change also. Okay, how about the second one? I haven't done the second one. I just did the first one. Did any group have a chance to do the, the, the second one? I wanna go out on a limb here, say what you got. I got the... parallel. Say again? I got parallel. You got parallel? Okay, so how about solving for y? What do we get when we solve for y here? The first one would be y equals two x minus four. 2x minus 4, that, that is correct. And then on this next one, y equals? 2x plus 5. 2x plus 5. Did, did anyone get anything different than that? Okay. 
then yeah, these are parallel. You can just see right here, they both have two. They should be parallel. Now, if I graph them, let me do a graph. Let's see, if I do two X minus four, I start at negative four, one, two, three, four, I put a dot. And then from there, I use the slope, which is two over one, which means up two to the right one, I put a dot, draw a line. <clears throat> then I do two X plus five. So I start out at five for my Y intercept this time, one, two, three, four, five. And then from here, I go up two over one and have a point here. And now I have my two parallel lines. Okay, so I, I like problems like this. There's a lot going on here because it kind of covers multiple topics at one time. And um, okay, yeah, so I'm gonna end it here. Let's take a break. We're gonna take a 10 minute break um, and then we'll come back. There's one more thing I wanna talk about with this and then we'll move into the next section. So, and that next section I'm thinking should only take us maybe 30, 45 minutes, maybe at the most, so. See. Y'all want a 10 minute break? Or should I just keep going? It's me personally, not speaking for anyone else. I would just kind of go through it, but I don't know how everyone else feels. Let's let's do a poll real quick. How many of you, yes, would like me to continue? No means let's take a break. Yes, continue, no, take a break. We'll go with the majority if we have a strong majority. Okay, everyone's voted. So 11 of you want me to continue and two want me to stop. So I'm gonna just continue them. Good news, we'll, we'll end a little early then. Okay, you ready? So I wanna talk about something, <clears throat> this is not necessarily something you'd be tested on, but it's I think it's something worth worth, uh, I guess, investigating this whole idea about parallel lines, right? That when you have two parallel lines, they don't touch one another, right? So if, if any of you have ever looked or studied like art, like art history, if you go back to like cave drawings, right? Let's, let's look at some cave drawings real quick. So when we look at cave drawings, would it be would it be uh, you know rude of me to say that that looks like like a kindergarten, grade school, elementary school kids drawing? I mean that's pretty like it's not quite stick figures, but it's it's pretty generic, wouldn't you say? Like. No one here is going to be considered to be an artist by today's standards. Would you agree? Yeah. I mean, they're, they're nice, but I mean, no. these are pretty, pretty basic drawings. Compare that to like, um, let's just go with um, like, trying to think of what we can look at. Um, Like compare that to like, like that, you know? I mean, this, what's the big difference between this and what we were just looking at? What's the big difference? Or like this one right here, like what's the big difference here? One definitely has a detail. Kind of looks more like a picture. Yeah, it looks real, doesn't it? Like, but what is it? What is it about it that makes it look real? A lot of depth, shading, depth, right? There's shadowing. This, yeah, the depth that's created, where the cave drawings were very flat, weren't they? Well, you're drawing on a flat surface. Your your picture is going to have to be flat, right? But this picture here of this looks like a little girl or something. That 
um, to me looks almost like what it would look like in person, you know, like it looks like the nose is kind of coming out, the lips are kind of coming out, the hair, you know, it's just, it's, we know it's on a flat sheet of paper. We know it's a flat drawing, but it's, it's tricking our eyes, isn't it? It's kind of like tricking our eyes into thinking it's, it's three dimensional, even though it's on a flat sheet of paper. Um, let me look for one more thing. Um, 3D art. Um, have y'all ever seen this stuff? Like 3D, 3D street art. Have y'all ever seen this? This this is like um, people go and they draw things. Like in a hallway, they'll draw something on the ground that looks like, like you can walk on this. This is just the floor of a building, but it looks like you like fall through the ground, right? Um, have you ever seen this? Like they do, there's like artists that work on the streets that do this stuff. Let me see if I can find one. Mm. Yeah, I guess this is a real, this is a real drawing that someone did in a park on the ground and it makes it look like it's falling away. Anyway, the, the whole point is that in the beginning of drawing that caveman, everything was flat because they're working on a flat sheet of paper. And as time has gone on, we've gotten better at drawing things that look realistic on flat things. And it all comes down to one basic principle and it's mathematical. So we've been talking about parallel lines, right? And we said two parallel lines won't hit each other, right? That's the whole idea behind two parallel lines. They won't hit each other. So I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna act like I'm a little artist here and I'm gonna draw you a street. Okay, I'm gonna draw the street, a road, and then I'm gonna draw a couple of buildings. Here we go. So this is a road and these are some buildings on the side and it's kind of like we're looking from the top down on this, right? Do y'all see that? Do y'all recognize that the lines that are parallel, all of these things are parallel, aren't they? Everything there is parallel to one another. And I'm following the rules that parallel lines will not hit each other. And there's my drawing. But my drawing kind of sucks. I mean, it's not very good. It's, you know, it's a, a kid could do that, okay? So what I need to do is I need to break the rules in order to trick you, in order to trick your eyeballs into seeing the road that's more like a realistic road, I need to violate the laws of math that say that parallel lines can't hit each other. And so if any of you have ever done, like taken an art class or into art, know what I'm talking about. I start with this thing called a vanishing point. And then from that vanishing point, I'm going to bring the road out to you. Okay, so now I've got a road. And then on the side, I'm going to draw some buildings like this. I'm just sketching this really fast so you get the idea. Okay, now that's a, that's a road. Do y'all see that? I mean, version A, version B. Version B is much, much more realistic. It has that depth, depth to it, right? And look, look at what's happening though. All the parallel lines are all doing what? I didn't do a very good job of this, but what are all those parallel lines doing? Intersecting at this point. So coming together to a point, this thing we call the vanishing point. And so the math that you study in college, in elementary school, middle school, high school, that, that, that math follows certain rules. That's called Euclidean geometry. Two parallel lines can never hit each other in Euclidean geometry. But I wanted to show you this because in the real world, there's other forms of geometry that we use in order to do different things. And this right here is called perspective geometry. And if you use perspective geometry, then you can actually draw things 
and trick people to think they're seeing something in, in more three-dimensional space. So I'm gonna go back to my Google search here and I'm gonna put here perspective art, let's say. See, so all of these are showing you how we can use perspective to get that, that kind of three-dimensional feel. Oh, that's, that's a pretty good road right there, right? You see? Trees are bigger and then they get smaller, but in this you can you can see, you can see they even have it here. There's like a parallel line that's going here. All those lines that in the real world, those lines would be parallel, but on the on the drawing, those lines have to come together. Okay. So I just wanted to show you that because I wanted you to, to understand, I guess that in our world, we have different forms of math, different forms of geometry, and we use them depending on what it is we need to do. Here, we're studying Euclidean geometry, and so parallel lines are gonna be, you know, like we said, equal slopes, parallel, but there's more out there. I like to, I like to equate this to like a fish bowl. That's a fish. That's another fish, okay? So when we sit here and say, parallel lines never hit each other. That's because that's what you've been taught. That's what you've been told. That's these fish. These fish only know that bowl, that bowl, right? These fish know only the universe that they live in, right? That's their universe is the fish bowl. They have no idea that they live on a table, right? And that there's a dog that lives here too and that there's outside and there's trees, like these fish in the fishbowl only know their universe. When we talk about parallel lines in this class, we are in the fishbowl of Euclidean geometry. I want you to just be aware that there's a whole other universe of math outside of Euclidean geometry that exists. That's all. That's the only reason I wanted to, to show that to you and to show you that we, we've used that as human beings to advance our abilities to draw things, manufacture things, you know, when you're sitting there, I know a lot of people are into their phones and video games. When you're sitting there doing a video game or something, all these things that are happening that looks real is a product of us understanding that there's more than just the fishbowl that we live in. Okay, I'm going to let it be at that and we will move on. Okay, so where are we here in our packet? Um, we've moved through, so let me be clear on what the homework is so that we don't have any issues here. So the homework for this starts on page 75. And let me see, you can work through all these. Okay, so I would say, um, Page 75, do everything, skip 15 through 19. Yeah. So the, the homework. Page 75, skip 15 through 19. But all the others you, you should be able to do. Okay, let's talk about functions. All right, so we're gonna be very simple here. We're not gonna to get too into this, but the idea of a function is this. A function is, is like a machine. I like to think of it like a car wash, okay? You have a car. I know that I'm like showing off my artistic skills today. Don't, don't be jealous, please. That's a car, okay? You take your car into the car wash, right? And it comes out. So when it went in, it was all dirt. Ooh. When it went in, it was all dirty and it comes out clean, right? So a car wash is just a machine. It takes something in 
and it spits something out, right? That's what a car wash does. Now, there are some things you cannot put into a car wash, right? Like you wouldn't want to put your dog through the car wash. That probably wouldn't be good. Or you yourself wouldn't want to walk through the car wash. Or maybe a big old 18 wheeler may not fit through this, right? So this machine has a restriction on what can go in, all right? And this is the way functions work. Functions are just machines. A function is like the car wash. It takes something in, but normally what it takes in is a number. And on the, out, on the other side, it spits out a number. Now, the number that goes in does not have to be the same as the number that comes out. It could be, but it doesn't have to be. So maybe you plug in two and it spits out four, or maybe you plug in two and it spits out two, who knows? The function can be different. It, it just depends, just like the car washes are different. This function can be anything, but there are some things we can't, some functions have problems with this, what, what can be plugged in, okay? They, they run into the, these things called domain problems or domain issues. So function is just plug something in, spit something out. So let's look at something we've already studied. If I give you this y equals 2x plus 1, we already know that that's a line, right? This is a linear equation. We could draw this. The slope is 2. The y-intercept is 1. We should all feel comfortable with what that is. But the way I want you to look at this right now is that if I give you an x value, okay, if I give you x and I send it through this function, okay, so if I tell you, hey, plug in the value for x right here, do this to it, then it's going to spit out this answer y, right? So it's going to spit out y, and the function is actually 2x plus 1. So for a specific example of this one, if I let x be, let's say, 2, what does that function do to 2? What does it spit out? So if I ask you to replace x with 2, what comes out of this? What number? Uh, I think five. Five, right? Y would be five, right? And I could give you another value. Like, what if I tell you X is zero? Plug that in, what would happen? Y would be, would be one. It would be one, right? And we could just keep doing this, right? We could keep doing this. So this machine, this function has inputs and outputs. Now I'm going to say something, be very careful, listen to, to my wording on this. Do you agree that in order for me to figure out why, in order to, for me to know what the y value is, I need to know what the x value is. Somebody has to give me x in order for me to tell you what y is. Someone has to give me what x is, then I can tell you what y is. Yes, that makes sense. So I could say this, y depends on x. This five depends on what I plugged in for x. The one depends on what I plugged in for x. Any answer I get will depend on the input. What comes out of the machine depends on x. So when we have this sort of relationship, what we do is we change the notation. We say instead of writing y equals 2x plus 1, we are going to realize that y depends on x. So we're going to replace y with f and then in parentheses x and then 2x plus 1. And what this means or what this notation means is that, that um, this is a function of x. Okay, that's what this, that's why we use the letter f. It's to say, hey, it's a function. And what it depends on is x. You give me x, I give you the output. Okay. And the, the good thing about this notation is that now, specifically, I can give you examples where I say find f of 2. So what would f of 2 be? We already did this. 2 goes through and spits out 5, right? So that means you replace the x with 2, and the answer should be 5. So 2 goes in, 5 comes out. 
I could do zero, f of zero. So now that's the zero goes in, one comes out. And so this is a new notation. That's all this is. <clears throat> this right here is just new notation. Another way of writing something. Okay, so I'm gonna give you a new example. Let, example, let f of x be equal to x squared plus 3x minus 7. Okay, so I am telling you, I'm telling everyone, by writing that down, I'm saying, hey, everyone, there's this function, okay? It takes these x's in, and here is what it does to the x's, right? That's the machine. That's the car wash. And so now I'm going to hand you a couple of cars and ask you to tell me, like, what comes out. So I'd like for us to find, let's say, let's find f of zero. That'll be an easy one. So that just means replace all the x's with zeros. And what does that spit out? These are zeros. What do you get here? You get negative seven. Seven. Okay. If I ask you to plug in one, you're going to get an answer. If I ask you to plug in three, you're going to get an answer. If I ask you to plug in negative two, you're going to get an answer. I'd like for you to take a minute to see if you can figure out what those are. I'm going to call on three people in about, I don't know, four minutes. I'll give you all four minutes just in case it takes you that long to see if you can get these three. I'm gonna call on three different people to give me the answers. Does anyone have a question on what you need to do before I let you do it? Okay. Okay. So Darshel, you're up. Did you get the first one? Um is it negative three? So you have one square mm -hmm. is one. Plus three times one is three, minus seven. Minus seven. Four minus seven, negative three. Good. 
Okay, good. How about um, Lewis? How about for F of three? F of three? Yeah. Um, Did you get that one? Yeah, I got, um, you know, I was, yeah. So you square three first, right? That means three times three. Yeah. Um, so nine. Nine. And then plus another three times three. Nine. And take away seven, right? Yeah. So nine and nine, that's 18. Yeah. Take away seven. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Yeah. How about the last one? The last one is the, I guess, the trickier one. Um, Bonnie, you're up for that one. Did you get that no. one? Yeah, I got um, negative 17. Negative 17. Let's see if that's right. Um, so, Bonnie, when you square negative 2, what's negative 2 squared? Um, positive 4. Positive 4. Good. Negative times negative is positive. And then you have your 3 times negative 2, which should give you minus 6, and then minus 7. The first two together, uh, four take away six is negative two, and then you minus seven. And if you take negative two and take away seven more, you get negative nine. I don't remember if that's what you said, but. No, I did a mistake. Um, what's it called? I forgot that it was positive four, so I added six plus four, giving me 10, then negative ah, seven. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Is everyone clear on the, the arithmetic here, the algebra that we need to get these answers? No questions. So let me let me let me write something down. And you know, from the work that we've done, I want to I want to point something out. Okay. So so watch watch what I write down here. F F of zero equals negative seven, right? When we plug in zero, we get negative seven. F of one equals negative three. F of three equals 11. F of negative two equals negative nine, right? That's, that's what we've determined, these, these four things. These are the X's that were plugged in, right? These are all the X's we plugged in. And these are basically the Y's that come out, okay? So that's the input and the output. The dirty car, the clean car, the dirty car, the clean car, each one of those, right? So if I were to ask you this question right now, for what X is F of X equal to 11? What's the answer? F of three, uh, yeah, three. Yeah, X is three. So when I say for what value of X is F of X equal to 11, I'm asking you to look at the Y value, right? And go over here and look at your Y values and say, where is it 11 and where did it come from? It came from three, right? Okay, I just wanna point that out because of where we're about to go with this. Now, on all of these, on all of these um, points, or sorry, on all of these um, inputs and outputs, we could look at these as points on a graph. Zero goes in, negative seven comes out. One goes in, negative three comes out. Three goes in, 11 comes out. Negative two goes in, negative nine comes out. And what we could do is we could graph these. Points. So let's start with the first point, zero, negative seven. That means the X value is zero, the Y value is negative seven. Here's a point on my graph. One, negative three means move to the right, one down three. Three, 11 means move to the right, one, two, three, and move up 11, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, that's way up here. 
And then negative two, negative nine would mean move to the left two, down nine, which would be here. All of these points represent what this function is doing. Now, it's not a straight line. Okay, this is not a, a, a straight, we cannot connect these in a straight line. And the reason why we cannot connect these is because this function right here that we have is not linear. And the reason it's not linear is because of the squared right there on the X. And so this is referred to as a quadratic function, but we'll talk about that later. All I want you to see right now is that if I've given you a function, you should be able to plot the points, points on that graph that each one of these inputs and outputs represents a point on the graph. Okay, I'm gonna, we're gonna do a new example. Let f of x be equal to negative three x plus nine. Part A, find f of negative three, b, find f of zero, c, find what x makes f of x equals zero, and then last one, find what x makes f of x equal negative 10. OK, let's go through these, all right? So for the first one, part A, all I have to do is replace x with negative 3. So I go to this function. And I replace my x with negative 3. And that gives me negative 3 times negative 3. That's 9. 9 plus 9 is 18. Right there. Now, the second one says replace x with 0. OK, so I go negative 3. I plug in 0 plus 9. And that just gives me 0 plus 9. The answer here is 9. Are those first two pretty straightforward? Any questions on those? Part C and D are different, though. Look at part C. It says, find the x that makes the output be 0. So what we want to do here is we want to know when, when is this equal to zero. When is this function going to spit out zero? And then the last one is saying, when is this function going to spit out negative 10? And both of these are linear equations that you have to solve. So like for the first one, let me, uh, let me move this out of the way. And that's for part D. For this one, for me to do this, I just isolate x. I'm just solving a linear equation. So I subtract 9 on both sides. So I subtract 9 here and here. And then divide both sides by negative 3. And I get x is equal to 3. Any questions on that? Do y'all see the difference between problems A and B and C and D, how it's a totally different approach? A and B, you're just plugging in, replacing X with the number, get an answer. For parts C and D, you're actually taking the function and setting it equal to these values and then solving. So there's more involved here. This one, I would have to subtract nine on both sides, get negative three X equals negative 19, and then divide both sides by negative three again. And get x is equal to, well, this is a decimal. I'm just going to leave it as 19 over 3 and just leave it as that answer right there. And it's positive because I had negative divided by negative. Questions? 
You sure? Can you go back to that the last problem I was writing? Yeah. But no questions so far. Uh, by the way, um, I sent out the notes from the previous classes. I put them in the Canvas. If you click on files, it'll say Zoom notes, and it'll be everything I've written down. It'll be there in, in Zoom, including today's stuff will be there, OK? Uh, right, so here's what I want us to do. I'm going to zoom out on this a little bit. This is our last little topic, and we'll be done for the day. All right, so in this problem, what we're given, this is a completely different problem than what we've done before. Here, what we're given is we're given the graph of a function. So this right here, oh man, in red, oh, I can't do it, okay. In this black right here, in this black right here, that's the function. That means that's, that's all the little points that our function spits out are all along this line and that line. And look, let's look at the questions. The first thing it's saying is for us to find f of three. So it's saying, if we let x be three, what comes out? So that means I'm gonna go to my x value of three, which is right here. And I'm going to go up and try and figure out where that point is. And there's the point right there. What is the output? So how high is that off the act? Uh, how high up is this? Well, it's four, right? It's four units high. So that means when I plug in three, it spits out four. Y'all see how I did that? X was three. Then I go find the point on the graph, figure out how high it is. Let's look at this next one, negative three. So if we let X be negative three, Go to the graph, one, two, here's negative three. I look for the point on the graph, which is about right here. How high is that point? Can y'all tell about how high up this is? One. Looks like about a one. Little low, a little level, yeah, like a little yeah, level. We'll just kind of eyeball it. We'll just say that looks like it's around one. Let's look at the next one. What's F of zero? So if we plug zero in for X, how high is the point? So zero is right here at the origin, right there. The point is, is up here. That's the point right there. So how high up is that point? What does it look like? Isn't it still four? Four again, right? It's four units high. Okay, let me ask, uh, let's see. Dina, I don't think I've called on you, um, so I'll call on you. I know you've participated, but so Dina, how about this last one, what, or uh, number 10? What's f of negative four? So can you tell if you go to negative four what the, where the point is and how high up and down it is? Zero. Zero, yeah. So if we go to negative four, that puts us, here's negative four, and then that's actually exactly where the point is. So it looks like the height of that point is zero because it's right there on the x-axis. So zero, good. All right, I want us to look at these. Um, let's see, this is gonna be a little hard. I'm gonna have to copy this. I don't know if I'll be able to paste it. Oh, you know what we'll do? This is what we'll do. I'm gonna clear this out. I'm going to copy this. Put it here. Make it smaller. And then I'll take these questions here and copy them.
All right. So a volunteer, how about a volunteer to tell me what number 11 is? What's F of negative 10? No? Would it be negative six? Negative six, good. So Juliet's going uh, negative 10, so moving over here all the way to negative 10 on the X, and then trying to find the point on the graph, which is down here, right there, there's the point on the graph, and that corresponds to a Y value of negative six. So this should be negative six, good job. Who wants to try number 12? Twelve is a little harder. For what value of x is the function equal to three? So keep in mind, what is this three that they're giving you? Is that the x that they're giving you or the y? The y. They're giving you the y. So you're trying to say, OK, Where's the where's the graph have a y value of three and what x value corresponds to that? So can you all see it? Anyone see it? Where is the y value three? Here's three on the y axis, right? You'll see that right there in yellow. That's three on the y axis. So the point that corresponds to that is right here, right? That's where the that's where the function hits three. What x did it come from? It looks like negative one, right? Because here's zero, here's one. This should be negative one right there. So the answer here should be X is negative one. Does that make sense or no? It's like backwards. Instead of plugging in the X and figuring out what the Y is, now we're, we're, we're plugging in the Y and figuring out what the X is. I got to make this a little smaller or else I can't fit it all. Maybe I can move this up. Uh, no, I can't. How about 13? Can anybody tell the answer for 13? We're giving you a y value of one. Go ahead. Negative three. Negative three, good. So we want a y value of negative, or sorry, y value of one. Here's one. If I move over, there's the point. The x it comes from is this one right here. And that's negative three, right? That's negative one, negative two, negative three. Good. How about the last one? For what value of X is the function equal to zero? So where is the Y value zero? Is it negative four? Negative four, good. X is negative four. And that's because again, over here, here's where the Y value is zero, right? And then that corresponds to an X value of negative four. Okay, that's, that's pretty much it. Um, you're gonna have to practice this. Let me tell you what homework to look at of the packet. So for this, uh, wait, where is it? Okay, so it's on page 85. They give you a function. They ask you to plug in negative three, plug in four. When is the function 33? Plug in six, plug in one eighth. I didn't do this. Use a calculator if you need to, okay? When is the function zero? Um, okay, I'm gonna let you read through that. So that, here's a graph that you need to read just like the one we did and then they ask you some questions. And that's it. So for this, um, page 85, do all the problems on page 85. So the homework, page 85. Okay, so your homework for tonight is, page 75, uh, everything except 15 through 19, page 85, all of them. And then from the beginning of class, we had those problems three through 10 from page 65. Now, in terms of our schedule, just so you're clear on this, we are slated to have another exam on Monday the 28th. 
which is what a week from today. So we're supposed to have another exam a week from today. And that will cover. Well, I think we may move it because we, we need to add a little more. We've done. We've done this now. We've done this. We need to do this section next class right here, which will be applications of linear. So word problems. And then we're not doing percent proportion conversion. We're not doing that. So yeah, I think this is realistic. We do one more concept next class, okay? And then we have a test on Monday over basically um, everything, everything that wasn't on the first exam. So that'll be percents and then it'll be lines, functions, oh, parallel perpendicular functions and then applications. So make sure you're keeping up with your homework because you know, in a week, we're going to have a test over this. So, all right. Any questions? You know what you need to do? Okay. Well, I told you we we're going to cut out early. So, that's it. I would expect on uh, Wednesday, I'll probably have a review for you ready for exam two. All right. Okay. You're free to go. If you have any questions, I'll hang out for a minute. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.